Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar about how the coronavirus will impact college admissions. My name is Vinay Bhaskara. I'm one of the co-founders of CollegeVine. So I want to get started today with a couple of updates on developments thus far, mainly in the form of standardized tests and college closures. Then we'll move on to our projections for the impact on current high school seniors, the impact on underclassmen and juniors, and the impact on international students. Let's get started with standardized tests. So beginning with the SAT and the College Board, and this update, by the way, includes both the SAT 1, or the main SAT, and the SAT 2 subject tests. If you had a school-administered SAT exam scheduled for March, April, or May, those exams have all been canceled by the College Board. Additionally, the May 2nd test date, which had both SAT and the SAT subject tests, is canceled. The June 6th SAT test date is currently still scheduled, but our projection here at CollegeVine is that this date will be canceled or severely disrupted due to the ongoing impact of the coronavirus. Right? Many school districts and states around the country have shut down for the rest of the school year, and because the College Board relies on high schools, middle schools, and local school districts as its infrastructure for giving out the exam, even if there are some test tests that are actually held on June 6th, we project severe disruptions. If you were registered for the March exam, one of those school-administered exams, or the May exam, you can either reschedule to that June test date or get a refund, which will automatically be sent to whatever payment method you used to register. However, our recommendations to families that have asked us is that we don't recommend rescheduling to June 6th because there's still so much uncertainty, and our projection is that that date will face severe disruptions. Our recommendations to most families is that they should wait until the fall uh, to reschedule for either the August exam or even later than that. Next, let's move on to the ACT. There was an ACT test date originally scheduled for this Saturday, April 4th, but that test has been rescheduled to June 13th. However, as with the June SAT, we project that the rescheduled test date in June is going to be canceled, or at least severely disrupted. The July 18th test date is still scheduled from the ACT, and right now we're optimistic that that test will be held as planned. If you were registered for the April exam, you can either accept the rescheduled date in June, or reschedule to a new date in July or in the fall once those test dates are released. In addition to the SAT and the ACT, AP, or Advanced Placement Exams, have also been impacted. These exams put on by the College Board were, tip were scheduled to be held in person between May 4th and 15th at high schools around the country. Those in-person exams have been canceled, and they've been replaced with 45-minute take-home exams that will only contain free response questions, no multiple choice. These 45-minute exams will still count for college credit, and they'll be able to, you'll be able to take them on a computer, a tablet, or your cell phone. You can also take a picture of handwritten work if you prefer that option. Because different school districts around the country saw their school year disrupted or ended at different times, these exams will only cover material in classes that was taught before March 10th. The idea being that they want to have a fair playing field for students who had their school canceled earlier. The College Board is going to offer two different exam dates for these AP exams, and they're going to be releasing additional details on Friday, April 3rd, uh, which is the day after this is being recorded. The IB, or International Baccalaureate exams, have also been impacted by COVID. The May IB exams have been canceled around the world, um, and certainly in the United States. However, if you were counting on using those exams to work towards a diploma or course certificate, you can still be awarded that diploma based on your work in class. So your school is going to upload your coursework and predicted grades to the IB's system, um, and there's a deadline for that on April 20th. So reach out to your school to make sure that they're taking the necessary steps such that you'll be receiving your diploma or course certificate. So that covers standardized tests. Next, we're going to move on to college closures. Businesses around the country have been impacted severely by the coronavirus outbreak, including restaurants, bars, etc., and colleges are no different. 
More than 800 colleges around the country have shut down indefinitely, and we actually expect the majority of colleges to shut down as shelter-in-place orders become more widespread. The day before uh, this recording, Florida and Georgia, two of the largest states in the country that were still open for business, so to speak, have now are now under shelter-in-place orders. And so we genuinely project that the vast majority of states around the country, plus or minus a few holdouts, are going to have shelter-in-place orders and shut down their colleges' in-person operations. There are still about 100 colleges that are open to admissions visitors, but again, we project that that's likely to reverse within the next couple of weeks. And admitted student events for students that have just been accepted to colleges have been canceled or moved online at the vast majority of schools that we've spoken with. If you want to get up-to-the-moment information about current college closures and what's going on with uh, colleges and their admissions visits and things like that, you can check out CollegeVine's COVID-19 Info Center at collegevine.com slash coronavirus. Uh, there, click over to the College Updates tab, and you'll see up-to-the-moment information, up-to-date information about all the colleges and the impact across a variety of questions that families have. So that's standardized tests and college closures, the developments we've seen so far. Next, I want to move on to College Line's projections for the impact on current high school students and international students. The first question that we've been getting from a lot of families is whether we think there's going to be any delay in sending out admissions decisions. More than 100 colleges still haven't released their admissions decisions, and they have notification dates in April or even later. Right now, we don't project any delay in schools releasing those, those decisions. And the reason is that at many colleges, 95% or more of the, of the decisions were made before mid-March, when a lot of schools started to shut down. The time remaining between the middle of March and when those schools actually send out decisions is largely about figuring out financial aid packages and filling those last or final spots in the class. So the good news is that we don't think there's going to be any delay in hearing back from a college whether you've been accepted, rejected, or waitlisted. However, if you applied for financial aid, we do expect substantial delays from colleges. As I just mentioned, colleges use those last couple of weeks before the decision date to finalize and fine-tune those financial aid packages and scholarships. In addition to that, some colleges still use legacy systems to determine financial aid that take time to spin up when you're working from home. Now, a lot of colleges use more modern software, but there are some that have uh, tougher operations to move to, to working from home. In addition to those logistical challenges, a lot of colleges are experiencing financial turmoil because of the drop in the financial markets. I'm sure many of you out there have seen your 401k or your investment holdings drop and faced a substantial financial impact, and colleges are no different. Many colleges, especially private colleges, rely on their endowments or their investments, essentially, uh, to fund their financial aid and scholarships each year. So when the markets go down, their endowments drop, and when their endowments drop, they have less money to give out to students in financial aid. Now, the good news is that if you've already been sent a financial aid offer, colleges are not going to revoke that financial aid offer that has already been sent to you. This impact is only on upcoming awards, awards that the college still hasn't sent out. And as I mentioned before, we think those, that those awards are also going to be delayed as colleges update the amounts due to the financial turmoil. So colleges are going to give out less in initial financial aid offers. But at the same time, colleges are also worried about filling their class, especially with uncertainty about international students given the travel restrictions uh, you know, placed by the U.S. government and by international governments around the world. This gives you an opportunity to negotiate with colleges for a better final price, especially if you are at least partial pay. You're able to pay partial tuition or something close to full tuition. In addition, if you can still afford to pay full sticker price, if you're lucky enough to have your family be in that position, you should reach out to the colleges that waitlisted you and let them know that you're still interested in the school. You don't have to necessarily say anything about your ability to pay full sticker, but reach out to colleges that waitlisted you and, and let them know, hey, I'm still very interested in your school. It's still one of my top choices. I'd love to hear back uh, if you have extra spots open up. If you are interested in negotiating financial aid, you can check out Advocate by CollegeVine, which is our online platform uh, that helps you negotiate financial aid. It's 100% free for families, and you can find that at collegevine.com slash advocate. And there's also a video that you can find there that will help you learn how to negotiate financial aid. You can see that right there on the screen here. 
All right. So the next deadline that a lot of families worry about after hearing back from schools about acceptances and hearing back from schools with financial aid offers is the deposit or enrollment deadline. This is the date at which you as a family have to tell a college, hey, we're choosing to enroll in your university, and usually the date at which you have to put down a deposit to secure your housing for the fall. Our projection is that colleges are going to be much more forgiving this year with that deposit and enrollment deadline, which is normally May 1st at most schools. More than 300 colleges have actually extended their deadline to June 1st or later this year, given the uncertainty around COVID. And we actually project that the vast majority of schools are going to join them and eventually move their deadline to June 1st. If we're still dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak in late May, there could even be a further ex extension to July 1st or even later. Right. Now, not every college is going to make this move because a lot of them want to try and secure their class beforehand, but we think that the vast majority of colleges are going to de extend their, that deposit deadline. If, unfortunately, one or more of your colleges chooses not to move back their deadline, um, one thing that you can consider doing is doing a double deposit, i.e. depositing, putting down a housing deposit with two colleges. Um, first, you can choose amongst your May 1st schools if there's one that you want to keep as an option and you know, send, send them a deposit. And then you can assess your June 1st schools, negotiate with them, etc., and then make a final decision before June 1st. It's not an ideal situation, especially because, you know, these are $300 or $400 deposits and not everyone can afford that. But if you can afford to put down a double deposit, that's one way to make sure you still have options and you can still consider all of your schools sort of holistically. Another question that we've been getting a lot from families is what's going to happen with the wait list, right? And so our expectation is that colleges, particularly selective schools, are going to put more students on the wait list than in a normal year due to all the uncertainty. We also expect colleges to accept more students off of the wait list, but mainly students that are full pay or high partial pay as far as tuition goes. If you need a lot of financial aid and you're on the wait list, colleges might not give you as much of a boost. One final note that we want to uh, share with families uh, is about when you should actually reach out to colleges if you have uh, admissions concern or if you just want to talk about financial aid and negotiate a better price. One thing that we urge all families out there to keep in mind is that admissions officers and college employees are just as freaked out as everyone else right now. In the best case scenario, they're having to adjust to working from home, uh, dealing with spouses and kids and, you know, laggy internet connections and every other problem uh, that, that folks shifting to work from home are facing these days. In a worst case scenario, they, have, they might have a family member who's a medical professional or out there working despite the COVID outbreak or, you know, potentially even have know someone that's affected by the coronavirus or in serious condition. Right. Um, so just as many of you out there, I'm sure, are facing a tough time with the coronavirus, a lot of college employees are in the same boat. And they're overwhelmed with trying to shift to work from home, scrambling to finalize decisions. In some cases, they're being asked to help their schools transition to online learning and take an all hands on deck approach to that. So our recommendation is that if you have a school that has only recently shifted to working from home, that has only recently shifted, um, you know, away from in-person operations, right, in certain parts of the country, give those admissions officers and college employees a week or so to settle into their new normal, right? Um, ultimately, you as a family need those admissions officers to help you out and to, in some cases, make a decision or make uh, a case for what you're asking them for to their colleagues. And they're going to be in a much better position to do that, in a much better emotional state to do that, once they're able to adjust to their new situation. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that you should wait for a month or two months to reach out to colleges, but try to give folks, you know, a week or even three or four days after they shift to online only operations, so that you get a better chance of having your outcome, and so that we give them a bit of a break just as I'm sure you'd like to get a break from people that are putting demands on you. Another question that a lot of worried families have been asking us is, will colleges be online in the fall? This could obviously be a pretty rough experience to have your first semester or your first part of your freshman year online. Right now, the colleges that we've talked to are all planning to be in person this fall, including summer orientation. This doesn't mean that they don't have backup options, especially if, for example, they start in person and then we have another outbreak of the of COVID. 
Um, and again, there are some risks here, right? Uh, we could see a second wave of infections in the fall, or the current wave could stretch out longer due to the fact that different parts of the country shut down at different times. If some of those risks come to bear, our current point of view based on our conversations is that colleges are much more likely to postpone, right, um, push back the start date uh, for their semester or even push back to starting in the spring semester than to go online. Now, some families that are worried about this and how it might dilute the experience are considering a gap year. And our recommendation is that if you want to take a gap year and enter as a freshman in the fall of 2021, make sure you reach out to the school and ask as soon as possible. If too many students start asking for gap years, colleges are going to be less likely to approve those requests. So make sure you get your request in as early as possible. One final note uh, is about academics and dropping grades, which in calmer times is known as senioritis. Our current point of view is that senioritis is already treated pretty flexibly by colleges, and we think there'll be even more flexibility due to the coronavirus outbreak. The key, though, is you want to comfortably pass your classes and graduate. If you're an A student, getting a couple of Bs, even one or two Cs, not the end of the world. Getting Ds or Fs, end of the world. <laughs> if you're a B student or a C student, Passing your classes uh, puts you in decent shape. Not passing your classes puts you at risk, right? And you want to make sure that you don't run into any weird diploma issues, either from failing a class or even just because of an elective that you were going to take in your third trimester or your fourth quarter of your senior year. Reach out to your school counselors uh, and check with them to see if they have if they have, are any issues like that. And you can also find information on that at your State Department of Education's website, where they have course requirements for getting your GED in your state. Um, you don't want to let any weird diploma issues hold up your ability to matriculate in the fall. Our recommendation also is that if you can, if you feel up to it, if you haven't been sort of emotionally whacked by the coronavirus and are facing some other situations and challenges, we think you should that families should still take, or students rather, should still take the AP exams. They're still going to confer credit, and they're only 45 minutes long, so there's very little risk and potentially a strong reward. So that was our current projections for the impact on high school seniors. Obviously, things can change, and uh, developments in the coronavirus outbreak have been happening every single day. But as of April 2nd, that's our projection for the impact on current high school seniors. Next, let's move on to our projected impact on current high school juniors and underclassmen. So I want to start with a quick summary of our overall projection for the impact of COVID on admissions for each grade. Juniors, obviously, are going to see the highest impact. For juniors, uh, you know, that's the most important time in the admissions process, right? And you've seen your spring semester grades and obviously extracurricular activities uh, have a severe impact um, for your process. So we think that there's going to be a very high impact on juniors. For sophomores, there's going to be a moderate impact, right? Sophomore year is when a lot of students start to transition away from making the jump from middle school to high school into being high schoolers and starting to explore opportunities. So we do think there's going to be a medium impact on sophomores, but you will still get your junior year in the fall and the spring. Obviously, if COVID has a second wave in the spring, sorry, in the fall, then your impact will increase. But for right now, we think that sophomores are going to have moderate impact. It's going to affect your admissions process, but that effect is going to be less than it is for juniors. If you're currently a freshman or an eighth grader or below, so a current middle schooler or elementary schooler, if someone happens to be listening to this, uh, to this recording, right now we project virtually no impact on your admissions process. Right? Um, the college admissions process is... Uh, something that changes very, very slowly, right? The typical timeline for a substantial change is measured uh, in decades, not years, right? So as a result, we don't think that you're going to see a substantial change at most schools. Now, some schools may have been on the fence about making a change, like switching to test optional or um, getting rid of a requirement like for SAT 2s. Um, so if those schools have seen, um, have, have basically, like, we're already planning on making a change, that change might get accelerated or catalyzed by COVID-19. But in general, we think that your admissions process is going to look pretty similar to what it was in the past for students in the class of uh, the high school graduating class of 2019 or 2018 or so on. So the biggest area that a lot of underclassmen have been asking us about is standardized tests. 
Um, and our point of view is that colleges are going to get more flexible, particularly about requirements like SAT subject tests or SAT2s. And the biggest thing that we want families to remember in this time is that everyone is in the same boat as you, right? Everyone is seeing an impact from canceled spring test dates and from, you know, the shifting timelines and school closures, right? Um, so, for example, if you were planning on taking the test multiple times to get a better score, there's going to be fewer opportunities for you to do that. So that might cause your score to drop. But hundreds of thousands of other families are also going to get impacted. So across the population, maybe overall scores, super scores for, for the SAT or the ACT are going to be lower. So just keep that in mind and, and try not to freak out too much because everyone is definitely in the same boat as you. The College Board and the ACT will also likely add extra exam dates to make up for cancellations. Um, this is either going to happen over the summer or they could add extra capacity to their exam dates in the fall to make sure that every student that wants to take a test has the ability to take a test. Now, we project that most colleges that still require exams are going to actually go test optional for the 2020 and 2021 application cycle only, even at highly selective schools. So we think that most schools are going to at least go test optional for one year. And there's actually already a general trend at colleges around the country, particularly less selective colleges, to shift to a test optional model. So some colleges that were already on the fence about going to test optional are doing a longer trial, where three years is the most common uh, length. But we want to dig in a little bit to what test optional actually means for applicants and for families. Right? Historically, students with strong SAT or ACT scores have had an advantage, even if a school is ostensibly test optional. And our point of view is that we still think this is the case, but if you have a strong GPA and coursework level, i.e. the level of courses that you take like AP or honors, for a given college, you're going to get a little bit more flexibility than you normally would, right? But we still think that having a strong SAT or ACT score is going to be an advantage. So our recommendation to families is that you should still plan to take the SAT or ACT, then if your score isn't what you hope for, plan around test optional admissions then, but start out intending to take the SAT or the ACT. Colleges are still going to look at your test score if you have it, and you won't be penalized for having high test scores, which is a worry that a couple of families have expressed to us. Colleges going test optional does not mean that, uh, that standardized tests are going to be removed from the admissions process. A lot of families have also asked us about exam curves, and right now our projection is that the curves for the SAT or the ACT will not become more difficult. The reason is that these tests have scaled scores, and they're going to be keeping the same format. So the same percentage of students will score a 35 or a 36 or, you know, a 1200 or a 1250 on the SAT. It's just going to be more students for each test date. The AP exam, on the other hand, we think that the curve will actually get harder. And there's two reasons for that. The first is that the exam is shorter. One of the reasons that students struggle to perform well on the AP exam, and that causes, you know, a 70% or 80% score to be worth a 5, or even a 60% score on some tests, is that because it's a three and a half hour exam, a lot of students get burned out by the time or run into time pressure when trying to finish their multiple choice questions. So that's one aspect, in that the shorter exam will mean fewer students get burned out on the timeline. The second aspect is that because the, the AP exams are going to be free response only, more students are going to receive partial credit on their essays or on their free response questions, right? Um, in a normal AP exam, you do get partial credit on free responses, but you lose 100% of the credit for the multiple choice questions that you skip or get wrong. With only free response questions, more students are going to receive partial credit. So our projection is that to score a 5 or a 4, you're going to have to get a higher percentage of the available points. So say there's 50, it's scored out of 50, you have to get maybe 40, where normally you'd have to get 35, right? Or um, basically, you'd have to get an 80% instead of a 70%, where the normal exam would be. So we think that the AP exam curve is going to get harder. We also think that AP exams will be given less weight in the applications process due to this change in format. So if you are going to rely on AP exams, as an important part of your application, you should consider taking a subject test as well to back up that AP score. AP classes that you take in school are still going to have the same weight in admissions. It's AP exams where, where we expect to see that shift. Keeping with the theme of academics, 
we also expect colleges to either, either throw out or reduce the weight of your grades from this current semester between January and June of 2020. So that's the second semester of your junior, your sophomore, or your freshman year, right? And so this is going to helpfully reduce the impact of your school switching to pass-fail. Additionally, to replace this missing semester, GPA in your first semester of senior year is going to become more important, right? So if you're a current junior, our recommendation is to try to get more college applications work done over the summer so that you can focus on building out and finalizing your EC profile and your GPA in this sort of fall of your senior year, right? The effect is going to be strongest for rising seniors, right? But it actually applies to all underclassmen. Uh, you want to make sure that your, your GPA in your first semester of senior year uh, is higher. So... Our recommendation is that if you haven't already and you're a current junior, start researching colleges now and begin to build your school list. In June and July, our recommendation is to work on your common application essay and your common application activities list and all the other aspects of it. And then in August, work on your supplement essays so, you, so that you have them out of the way before you start really digging into school. And colleges will be more understanding of weaker grades in the current spring semester of your junior year, or sophomore year, or whatever. Um, so it's not the end of the world if you're struggling with the, with the shift to online learning, but you got to make sure that you buckle back down when you get back to school in the fall. So I want to quickly give a summary of our projected changes to the admissions process and how different elements of your application are going to be weighted. So some of the aspects of the admissions process are going to become more important, things like essays, your first semester senior year grades, the level of courses that you chose to take in your junior year, and the alumni interview. Some stuff is going to become less important, your second semester junior year grades, your AP exams, your recommendation letters, your SAT and your ACT. Some stuff is going to be treated pretty similarly. Your extracurricular activities are going to be treated pretty similarly, demonstrated interest where that's applicable, and your grades from all other periods i.e. The, the parts of your transcript that were not affected by COVID. And I want to briefly touch on why the alumni interview is going to become more important and why rec letters are going to become less important. So the alumni interview and rec letters are usually used together to get a sense of your personality and um, your ability to sort of create a connection uh, with adults and with, with other people. Normally, the teacher recommendation letters and your guidance counselor rec are weighted more heavily, particularly the teacher recommendations, right? But our recommendation for families and sort of what most families do is pick a couple of teachers from your junior year because they're the ones who've taught you most recently. Obviously, with, you know, potentially a third to half of the year cut off for a lot of schools, those junior year teachers are not going to be able to see a full year of your development. So colleges are going to weight those recommendation letters a little bit less and weight the alumni interview a little bit more um, because that's something that will still happen in its normal time frame. Another question that we get a lot from families is, will admissions get easier? That's uh, a hope that a lot of families have. The answer at selective colleges is no, right? They're still going to have 50 or 60,000 applicants for 1,500 spots or even less. Um, the thing that we do expect is that actually colleges will have less data on different applicants because of the cutoff of spring junior ECs and things like that. So we actually think that admissions at selective schools is going to get more random. Amongst all the schools that, amongst all the students that have a qualifying SAT score or a strong enough GPA, you're going to see less variation and sort of more just like, you're going to see those students are not going to be able to separate themselves as much because of the cutoff in junior year. And so you're actually going to see those admissions get more random. So our recommendation is that if you are aiming for selective colleges, apply to more schools. At non-selective schools, we think admissions will get easier, especially because test optional will increase the number of students who are qualified on GPA and academics alone. Another question we've, we've been getting a lot from families is about alternatives to researching colleges when you can't visit in person. Now, the schools have formal information sessions online, and those do a pretty good job of, re of replacing the admissions officer sessions at, you know, that you would uh, see at a on in-person, on-campus visit. But the value of a college visit doesn't just end with being able to talk to an admissions officer, right? A lot of what makes a college visit so great is your ability to get a feel for what things are like um, at the school with the students. 
right? So our recommendation, our best recommendation as of right now um, for things you can do immediately is to check out informal vlogs from students on YouTube and Instagram. These aren't perfect and obviously they present a, a biased sample of what campus life is like, but at least you'll be able to get a sense of what is going on on campuses. If you want to do any independent research and compare different colleges on things like your likelihood of getting in, or the graduation rates, student outcomes, what the campus location is like, etc., you can actually check out our app at app.collegevine.com uh, that has a ton of free resources. You can check out our school hub um, in particular to do your independent kind of college research. And currently, we are planning on hosting Q&A sessions with current students at different colleges. The first of those sessions will be occurring next week. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled, um, or, or stay tuned, rather, uh, to the announcement, or, or rather, for the announcement of those Q&A sessions in your email inbox. However, the value of college visits for families is in the research, but there is still also value for colleges themselves in the form of demonstrated interest, right? College visits are a powerful signal to a college that you're very interested in that school and that you're likely to enroll once you're accepted, right? And the reason is that college visits are expensive. You're giving up your free time, potentially a weekend or a vacation day to visit the school. And in some cases, you may have paid a lot of money to travel to the university, right? And so at a lot of schools, visiting a college increases your chances of admission, but even at colleges who don't consider demonstrated interest in whether they accept or reject you, visiting the school can still be very valuable. And the reason is that colleges also have a limited amount of financial aid to give out. And they tend to want to give out more financial aid and scholarships to students that they think are more likely to enroll. And so if you're, some, if you're someone who actually visits in person, colleges are more likely to give you a better scholarship or financial aid package. So, if you were planning on visiting a college in person in the spring, you should try to visit in the summer or fall if you can, ideally the fall because then students will be back on campus. If you're not able to visit in person, you can also attend online events, but that's not as powerful of a signal because that's just you signing into a, an online event from your computer. So our recommendation is after the craziness dies down and as we get into kind of May and, April, and even June, you should actually reach out personally to the colleges that you plan on visiting and say, hey, uh, you know, I was planning on visiting your school this spring, but we weren't able to because of the COVID outbreak, obviously. So are there any resources you can share that I can that will help me learn more about your school? That's a way of reaching out personally to a college and, you know, demonstrating your interest. And you should reach out to whoever the regional admissions officer is for your part of the country. You can actually find that on the admissions website at the university. Another question that families have been asking us is about the applications timeline. Will there be any changes to the application deadlines, which are typically November 1st for early applications and January 1st for regular applications? Our honest answer is we don't know. It depends a lot on how long the COVID outbreak continues. From our discussions, if things wrap up by the beginning of the summer, our expectation is that you're going to see a relatively normal timeline where November 1st and January 1st are still the primary deadlines. If things get further impacted in June and July, however, or if there's a second outbreak in the fall, we expect colleges to push back their early and regular application deadlines at that point. Given the impact of the COVID outbreak on your junior year, it is also important to think carefully about which colleges you'll apply to with your early application, whether that's early action or early decision, right? A lot of colleges will give you a bit of a boost if you apply in the early process. And so if you were planning on relying on your junior year grades and spring ECs to boost your profile, you should consider switching to early decision two or early action two, which has a December or January instead of an October or November deadline. The reason is that you'll get a full semester of senior year grades to help that, pa that part out, and you'll be able to do some senior year, year extracurricular activities and or incre improve your existing activities um, to boost your chances. If your profile is in good shape already and you can afford to go to the school regardless of financial circumstances, you should consider applying during that ED1 or early decision one period. The reason is that we actually expect colleges to accept more students during the ED process than normal, but we also expect colleges to give out smaller financial aid packages than normal to those ED students. Another question that we've been getting a lot uh, from some early planners and people that are interested in getting started with applications right now is whether they should write an essay about the COVID experience. Our honest recommendation is don't do it. 
Obviously, this is a very emotional and powerful uh, time for a lot of students, a lot of families out there. And, you know, everyone is going through this, right? Uh, Even in my situation, right, my mom is a healthcare worker, and I wake up every day worrying about her potential exposure um, to COVID-19, right? So it, I, I, believe me when I say I get that this is a very emotional and impactful period. The problem is that every single student in the country is going through the situation together, right? And so a lot of students are going to end up writing about it. And there's an element here where admissions officers are just human beings too, right? And they're sitting there and they're reading application after application, essay after essay. And at a certain point, regardless of how emotional or how impactful or how powerful different... Uh, you, sorry, your different essays about COVID-19 can be, at the end of the day, they're going to just tire of reading them. And they're going to give you less of the benefit if you have a more creative or a better essay about the topic, right? Even if you write an excellent creative essay about co- your experience with COVID-19, admissions officers are going to be so tired of reading about it that it just won't be as effective. That's just the way human nature works. And in normal times, this is the reason why, for example, writing about your story of growing up in an immigrant family or an Asian American family doesn't do as well in the admissions process. Another question we've been getting from a lot of families is about financial aid, right? Our expectation is that colleges will be much less generous next year with financial aid, as we mentioned earlier, because of the impact on their endowment. If you're lucky enough to be able to afford full pay, even after everything that's gone on, then you should consider applying to a few more stretch or reach schools. These are schools where your profile or your test scores are a little bit weaker than that of the typical student. In normal times, you might have a low chance of acceptance, but with the impact of COVID-19, you could see a boost if you are full pay. Even if you are not in that lucky position, um, you should also keep documentation this year of every financial change or expense that you faced due to the COVID-19 outbreak. This is going to be useful for financial aid applications and negotiation down the line. Finally, I want to touch on extracurricular activities because a lot of students have obviously seen your spring extracurricular activities affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. Before I dive in to how to tackle ECs in the current climate, I want to just give a brief primer um, and refresher on how extracurricular activities are judged in the admissions process. So there's three key components uh, or three key areas of value for extracurricular activities in the admissions process. The first is your level of accomplishment. This is things like winning a leadership position, uh, earning an award, or placing well in a competition at the regional, state, or national level. But the value of an EC is not just in your accomplishments. It's also in the depth and breadth of your commitment. The depth of your commitment is how much of your free time are you devoting to this activity? How many hours per week or you know, hours per month are you putting into this activity? The longer you spend on an activity each week, the more valuable it's going to be in the admissions process. In addition to depth, breadth also matters. An activity that you've been doing for multiple years is going to be ma- more valuable than one that you just picked up in November or December of your senior year right before applying. So the breadth of commitment also matters. Colleges get that you won't be able to maintain continuity or commitment with in-school clubs or stuff affected by COVID, like volunteer work. However, it's still really important that you redirect that passion elsewhere, right? Your application is going to stand out more if you find ways to engage and keep yourself busy despite the impact of COVID-19. The main mantra you should follow when planning ECs during the COVID-19 outbreak is to get creative right? One thing you can do is reach out to school officials and see if there's anything you can do to help. If you have clubs that had their schedule impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak, you can do work that can be done offline or asynchronously. For example, you could create training materials or a resource hub to be used next year in the spring, um, right? That can be used by new entrants to the club and returnees. You can also take the initiative to organize virtual meetings for clubs and organizations like a debate club or an animate club. In addition to trying to keep your normal high school clubs going, you can also work on self-driven projects, fix a car, take up woodworking, or even build a mini golf course for your sister in your backyard. In normal times, these activities might not be as valuable as, you know, your in-school clubs or your formal competitions. But in a world of coronavirus, one of the things that colleges are really looking for is for you to show initiative um, and show that you're self-driven. And working on independent and self-driven projects is a great way to do that. Another thing that fits in that category is creating content or doing research, even writing a paper about a subject that you're passionate about. 
learn more about that subject. This is a great opportunity, and there's tons of information on the internet that you can use to become an expert in something that you're interested in. One additional activity type that we are particularly fond of recommending to families is to reach out to people in your community who are elderly, alone, or otherwise isolated due to the COVID-19 outbreak, and keep them virtual, right, over Zoom or over the phone, company. The people that are most impacted by the coronavirus are folks that are elderly, immunocompromised, or in some way isolated. And while it's obviously a good thing that everyone's staying home and flattening the curve, you also want to make sure that people don't spend this entire outbreak lonely and starve for companionship. Um, so this is an activity, quote unquote, that's go both really good for the world. You're going to be keeping someone company and helping them save, starve off loneliness, and it'll be good for your resume. You can even, if you used to be a volunteer at a nursing home or something like that, see if there's a way for you to volunteer to keep residents or someone like that company, you know, virtually over Zoom or over a FaceTime. So that wraps up our projection for the impact on current high school juniors and underclassmen. The last group that we want to quickly touch on is international students, who we've been getting a lot of questions from. Right now, the impact on international students depends a lot on the length of the outbreak. Right. The U.S. government has currently placed, obviously, severe travel restrictions on multiple countries around the world. And we don't necessarily know when that's going to end or if those could come back after uh, the summer if there's a second outbreak in the fall. So the first thing to watch out for is just whether there are travel restrictions and making sure you are either in the U.S. or comfortable staying at home and, and delaying until you can get back into the U.S. Right. Now, as far as admissions requirements, colleges are likely to get more flexible about the TOEFL, SAT, or other requirements that they normally have for international students. Where they will not get more flexible is about visa issues or about finances, right? In particular, you want to make sure that you have enough U.S. dollars to be able to pay full tuition at the schools that you're looking at, right? In the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak, you could see many countries around the world institute capital controls that make it harder for you to convert your local currency into U.S. dollars. So make sure that you have U.S. dollars available to be able to pay tuition. Now, if you're an under international underclassman and you're full pay, so a junior, current junior, current sophomore, you can also consider applying to more reach or stretch schools as well. There's more uncertainty from colleges about international students that will matriculate. So if you're able to pay full sticker price, you should apply to stronger schools than you might normally choose to. All right, so before we wrap up here, I want to just share some additional resources that were mentioned throughout the presentation. First is our COVID-19 info center. That's collegeline.com slash coronavirus. If you're interested in negotiating financial aid, that's collegevine.com slash advocate. And then if you're interested in researching colleges, as I mentioned, that's app.collegevine.com. Click over to find schools to access our school hub there. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and stay safe.